next presentation is going to be on rehearing and reconsideration, uh, another kind of fun topic. Uh, and, and to talk about that today, we have Sarah White. Uh, Sarah is an attorney at Whites and Schwartz in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, she's board certified in appellate practice. Um, Sarah has been a member of the uh, Appellate Court Rules Committee since 2018, and she serves on its executive subcommittee. Um, she's also an active member of the uh, Appellate Practice Sections Pro Bono Committee, where she's a regular volunteer for the guardian ad litem cases and, and other cases. Um, she's also active in the Broward County Bar Association's Appellate Practice Section. Uh, Sarah is a graduate of Emory University School of Law, where she participated in moot court and won an award for her oral advocacy. Um, she has handled more than 100 appeals in the Florida DCAs and the 11th Circuit. So she's uh, well qualified to talk to us today about uh, motions for rehearing and reconsideration. Sarah? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. One second. Good. Well, all right. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction and to the Guardian Ad Litem Program and the Pro Bono Committee of the Appellate Practice Section for this opportunity to speak with you today about rehearings and reconsiderations. I'm going to turn off my video so we can focus on the um, uh, slideshow here. All right, so um, I'll give you an overview and then we'll launch into the details. Um, rehearing versus reconsideration. I'm going to talk about how they are different and why those differences matter for appellate purposes. These terms are often used interchangeably uh, in the case law, but their respective impact differs in a very material way. So we'll go over that in a few minutes. I'll also talk about when a motion for rehearing is necessary. Um, we'll take a look at preservation issues uh, that touch on uh, rehearing. And we'll talk about what to do if time is running short, but you want to address an issue before the trial court, um, before possibly launching into an appeal. And then finally, I will we'll, um, touch on your obligations of professionalism in the rehearing context. So um, just a general overview, um, rehearing, uh, a trial court can rehear a final order under 1.530 of the Civil Rules of Procedure. Um, a pending motion for rehearing tolls rendition of a final order or judgment, thereby tolling the time to appeal under uh, the appellate rule 9.020H1B. Um, the appellate rules provide that an order is rendered when a signed written order is filed with the clerk of the lower tribunal. And the rules calculate the deadline to file an appeal from the date of rendition. So rehearing suspends rendition of the order under the rules of civil procedure. However, um, just a caution when you're dealing with guardian ad litem appeals and dependency cases, um, this tolling is not applicable under the rules of juvenile procedure. And I'll focus on that a little bit more um, in a minute. Uh, meanwhile, reconsideration. Uh, the trial court has inherent authority to reconsider any of its non-final interlocutory orders before entering a final judgment. Uh, a motion for reconsideration does not toll rendition. And so it does not toll the time to file an appeal. And that is a very key material difference, obviously, from rehearing. Um, so your starting inquiry, when you when you're have an order you want to challenge, your starting inquiry really should be, what kind of order do I have? Is it final or is it non-final? Um, and once you have the answer to that question, you'll know which of these buckets you're going to be uh, diving into. Um, as a final note on, on just the general overview of these two um, items, nomenclature of the motions does not control um, meaning that courts will treat a mistitled motion as a motion for rehearing if it's timely and asks for um, rehearing relief. But specificity is always best. I think it's, you know, it's always best practice to figure out how you're proceeding and what your authority is and refer referring to the rules before you file any kind of motion for rehearing or reconsideration so that you have clarity in your record. And that's especially important when you have multiple parties dealing with multiple claims. So let's take a closer look at rehearing under rule 
3.0. As I just said, that rule deals with final orders only. It gives broad authority to the trial court to revise its ruling on all or a part of the issues under subsection A of the rule. Um, this means it gives uh, the broad scope of this rule permits a wide range of challenges. The motion um, or the challenge can be raised on any party's motion or on the uh, court's own initiative under subsection D of the rule. And um, this, this broad authority to revise the ruling, um, you know, basically means that to have a legally sufficient motion, um, it needs to be, your motion must be specific enough to identify the issue and it must be timely um, for the court to reconsider. Um, timeliness means that the motion must be served within 15 days of the order's entry. Um, this is a jurisdictional deadline. The time cannot be enlarged under Rule 1.090B2. Um, so when that 16th day arrives, you're no longer in the, uh, you no longer have the ability to seek rehearing of a final order. Um, and an interesting feature of this rule is that the motion has to be served. That's the language of the rule, served, not filed. So that's under uh, subsection B of 1.530. So use caution um, when you're involved with pro se litigants as you, you might be, find yourself um, in, in the pro bono context. Uh, pro se litigant, you know, there's still plenty of pro se litigants who may not be um, registered for e-service um, and may still need mailing. So just, just be aware. Um, the rule pertains to jury and non-jury trial situations as well as summary judgments. So when, you're, when you have a non-jury trial, as many are these days, um, or a bench trial as they're also known, the court may open up the judgment if one has been entered, take additional testimony, and enter a new judgment under subsection A of the rule. So again, there's that broad authority to revisit rulings. However, you get one bite at this apple under the rule. No successive motions are permitted. Um, the trial court, as I said a few moments ago, the trial court loses jurisdiction to rehear a matter after denial of the first motion, um, except for the grounds um, provided in the following rule, Rule 1.540, which I'll which I'll talk about in a moment, so we don't get them confused. Um, However, the rule does permit an amendment of a timely motion to state new grounds. So if you have additional grounds um, to, to assert for rehearing purposes, um, as long as you've got that first motion for rehearing in timely, you can amend it under the court's jurisdic, uh, I'm sorry, under the court's discretion. So the courts can say no, um, you do need to seek permission, but under the court's discretion, it will allow amendment under subsection B of the rule. Um, it doesn't provide a specific time frame for amendment, but you know, common sense says don't delay. Uh, no hearing is necessary to deny a motion for rehearing, so you certainly want to get that amendment in the, the minute you suspect, uh, the minute you know you have grounds for an amendment. Um, as I said a moment ago, just use caution. Don't confuse a motion under Rule 1.530 with a motion to vacate a final under a final order under Rule 1.5. 4.0, which provides for relief from judgments. I've seen quite a few uh, motions out there confusing these two rules, but they have they have different purposes and different functions. Um, 1.530 provides broad authority to alter a ruling within a short period of time. 1.540 provides narrow authority to alter a ruling within a longer period of time. So within um, for, uh, under 1.530, if you're filing a motion for a hearing, you can revisit, again, all or part of the issues. That's pretty broad. 1.540 provides five grounds in which the court uh, can exercise jurisdiction, <clears throat> so it's much more limited. And also, um, talking about this 1.540, be aware that no motion for rehearing of an order granting or denying a Rule 1.540 motion is permitted. I've seen that before where a party moves to vacate a final judgment under Rule 1.540, obtains an order, and moves for rehearing or attempts to move for rehearing of that order. Uh, you can't do that. Um, the appropriate uh, re you know, remedy at that point is to proceed directly to an appeal under Rule 9.130A5 of the appellate rules. 
um, because that is in a non-final appealable order. Um, pending motions um, for rehearing will toll rendition, as I said before, and thus the time to appeal uh, when they are timely served. Again, there's that caveat. It's got to be timely. It's got to be before that 15th day ends. Um, <laughs> no hearing is necessary under the civil rules, as I said a moment ago. However, um, under the family law rules, rehearings are slightly different, only slightly. Um, the pro bono committee met right before this panel began earlier this morning and um, mentioned we, we were discussing the kinds of appeals that frequently come in in pro bono and apparently there are a lot of family law cases right now. So uh, I just want to mention that rule 12.530 of the family law rules of procedure is modeled on rule 1.530 and has many of the same um, substantive elements but uh, like the 15-day jurisdictional window in which to serve a motion, um, it permits the trial court to reopen and take additional evidence. Um, but there is a key difference in that the trial court makes an initial review of the motion under 12.530 to determine whether a hearing is necessary. That's subsection F of that rule. If a hearing is uh, found to be warranted, the trial court gives notice and proceeds with a hearing. Otherwise, it denies the motion. So if you have cases, uh, divorce cases or what have you under the family law rules, be aware of that um, that difference in the rule. So as I said a few moments ago or a few minutes ago, rehearings in the dependency context are different. Uh, so if you have a guardian ad litem appeal, it's worth knowing that rule um, 8.265 of the rules governing juvenile procedure um, ha it is quite different. It is a little more limited in scope. It has six listed grounds for a motion for rehearing in subsection A of the rule. Uh, those grounds include that the court erred in the decision of any matter of law arising during the hearing, that uh, a party did not receive a fair and impartial hearing, that a party required to be present at the hearing was not present, that there exists new and material evidence which if introduced at the hearing would probably have changed the court's decision and could not with reasonable diligence have been discovered before the hearing, um, that the court is without jurisdiction of the proceeding, or that the judgment's contrary to law and evidence. So that's that's the scope of this rule. Um, rehearing, rehearing may be granted to all or any of the parties on all or any part of the issues under the rule. Um, and then there's the timing element. This is this is really uh, another spot where this rule functions very differently from rule 1.530 uh, of the civil procedure rules. A motion for rehearing in the dependency context under this particular rule must be made within 10 days of the entry of the order. And the court shall rule on the motion for rehearing within 10 days of the filing or it is deemed denied. Um, and here's why that matters. A motion for rehearing under rule 8.265 does not toll the time for the filing of an appeal. Um, so you can see how this would impact your appellate deadlines. If you're filing this kind of motion and a motion is deemed denied um, without having been you know, specifically uh, receiving an order, it's going to affect your deadline. So you have to be very vigilant in this context. Um, so as, a, as the first ECA said in a recent case um, issued a couple of months ago, um, in that case, uh, you know, I think the timelines are helpful to see what happened there because I think one of the attorneys was um, focused on the civil rules. Um, a parent filed a motion to set aside an order four days after it was entered and the court did not rule by the 10th day. So under the rule, 8.265, it, it was deemed denied, um, and the parent had until, uh, you know, about two weeks later to file an appeal, but didn't. So the court said, for reasons that are not apparent on this record, there was no further relevant activity until the circuit court issued an order on March 5th, uh, denying, several months later, denying the parent's motion to set aside. Um, the notice of appeal was filed about 30 days later, and under any other circumstances not subject to the uh, judicial rules of uh, the rules of judicial procedure, the notice of appeal would have been timely as to some of the orders had they been appealable at all. But because the parent did not appeal um, 
within 30 days of the entry of the original order, it ended his appellate prospects. So this rule functions very differently from the rules of civil practice. And I think that's something to be uh, acutely aware of as you're calendaring and as you're litigating these kinds of cases. Um, again, rule, uh, motions for hearing under uh, rule 8.265, um, the nomenclature does not control. So uh, there, I found several cases in which um, uh, litigants filed letters explaining that they'd been absent from a hearing uh, at which their presence had been required and the uh, appellate courts found the trial courts should have treated that as a motion for rehearing under this rule. Um, so that's something to be aware of as well as you're litigating these cases. Uh, so independency proceedings, it's important to pay particular attention to your deadlines and rule back, refer back to the rules often. So 10 days, within the entry of the 10 days, there needs to be a motion for a hearing if one is going to be filed. Court has another 10 days to rule on it or else it's deemed denied and that leaves 10 days to appeal. So let's move on to reconsideration. Uh, as I said before, reconsideration functions very differently. Uh, it is uh, motions for reconsideration are made within the in, or under the inherent authority of the trial court. Uh, they go to interlocutory non-final orders, unlike the rules of procedure that we just discussed. These are non-final orders here. Um, and the trial court has considerable discretion before the entry of a final judgment to uh, revise or re, um, to uh, revisit its orders. Um, before I go there, um, can, you know, there, the reconsideration has been described as a creature of the common law. Um, the trial court's inherent authority to reconsider orders has been recognized for over 100 years. Um, in the 1920s, in fact, the Florida Supreme Court said that it's well settled that interlocutory judgments or decrees made in the progress of a cause are always under the control of the court until the final disposition of the suit, and they may be modified or rescinded upon sufficient grounds shown any time before the final judgment. And that's from Alabama Hotel versus Jail Mott Iron Works, the 1924 decision. So that just emphasizes um, the, the historic nature of um, reconsideration. Um, so it, reconsideration does not hold the time for appeal, which is important to know when you're, when you're dealing with this. So you need to make sure that if you file a motion for reconsideration of a non-final appealable order, um, you'll have to get it heard within 30 days um, if you plan to appeal that order right away, if it's if it's appealable under the rules. Um, the reason is that motions addressed to non-final orders are not authorized tolling motions under the rules. Um, so you have to use particular caution with orders granting or denying motions to vacate under Rule 1.540, as I talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, since an order on a 1.540 motion for, to vacate a final judgment is an appealable order, the rules do not authorize a motion for reconsideration of such order. Um, and that's because a rule granting or denying relief from judgment is not in itself a judgment subject to the rehearing rule. So you have to repeal that immediately. Um, there's no express limit on the number of motions for reconsideration that you can file but don't be that attorney. Um, you you want to not try the uh, patience of your trial court. It's best to use your study professional judgment about whether a, uh, a non-final order should be subject to a motion for reconsideration. If it's uh, if it's necessary and appropriate, then by all means file it. But um, marshal your arguments, make them all accordingly, so that you don't have to revisit it later. And again, nomenclature does not control here. If you title if you title your motion for reconsideration um, as a motion for rehearing, uh, you know, if you're, as long as you're dealing with a non-final interlocutory order, the trial court will understand. But obviously, clarity is always helpful uh, in that context. A case um, that reviews the differences between reconsideration and rehearing in a very helpful way is uh, Helmick versus Wells Fargo Bank, a 2014 decision by the Florida's first DCA, um, it, it walks through uh, these differences um, between these two um, creatures and, and um, highlights um, you know, the ways in which 
they, they function uh, within litigation. So moving on, uh, a question I've heard a number of times actually is, do I have to file a motion for rehearing before seeking appellate review? Um, so I'd like to start with a couple of key appellate principles to answer that question. Um, first, preservation. Um, that is certainly the watchword of appellate work. Um, if it's, um, you know, a preservation requires that a party bring an error to the trial court's attention before seeking appellate review. We talked a lot about preservation earlier in this panel. Um, there were a number of presentations that really walked through situations um, in which preservation, um, you know, highlighting preservation, um, because generally the appellate court will only review for well-preserved errors in the record. So that means in broad brushstrokes, uh, it will look for legal issues raised in the pleadings, factual issues raised in the evidence, um, and evidentiary issues and trial maintenance issues that were raised in objections resolved with a definitive ruling. So otherwise, if it's not well preserved, review is for fundamental error. You're raising it for the first time in that kind of situation. Um, fundamental error is rarely found. It's error that goes to the foundation of the case or the merits of the action. Um, so we're talking about situations in which uh, we're dealing with statutes that are unconstitutional on their face, not as applied to a given set of facts, but on the face of the statute, it's unconstitutional. Or errors going to the legality of trials such that ver of the verdict could not have been reached without the error. Or situations in which the trial court just did not have jurisdiction at all. So, you know, judgment was entered against a non-party would be an example of that. Or violation of due process. Violations of the right of counsel. Um, the right to counsel, rather. So when asking if you need to file a motion for rehearing, the analysis could be, do I have a final order in the first place subject to the rehearing rules? And if so, have I preserved the issue already in the record, um, in the pleadings, the evidence, the objections, the rulings? If you have, great. You may not need to move for rehearing purposely, purely for preservation purposes. You may do it anyway if you feel like you have a chance of getting a different result. Um, but for pure preservation purposes, odds are in that sort of scenario that um, a motion for rehearing is not strictly necessary. But if not, and you feel in your professional judgment that you have meritorious grounds to seek rehearing, uh, you probably should uh, file a motion providing specific arguments and asking for the relief that you feel is proper to flesh out the argument that you feel like wasn't really fully explored before. Um, it's not perfect, but doing so increases your chance of having a shot at showing you preserved the issue and, and possibly uh, avoiding an appeal altogether. Um, as a reminder, uh, Jesse Harrell walked through um, rehearings a little bit in um, her memo of law presentations, and that's um, maybe something to refer back to as well. Notably, Rule 1.530E um, provides a situation in which a party may raise an issue for the first time on appeal. Subsection E reads, when an action has been tried by the court without a jury, the sufficiency of the evidence to support the judgment may be raised on appeal whether or not the party raising the question has made any objection thereto in the trial court or made a motion for rehearing, new trial, or to alter or amend the judgment. So, under this subsec what, subsection, what you need is a bench trial and a sufficiency of the evidence issue. Um, there are lines of case law in areas often served by pro bono counsel, holding that reversal of a judgment was warranted where the appellant raised a challenge on appeal to the sufficiency of the evidence, even when there was, say, no hearsay objection um, raised below. Um, one example is Brown versus International Paper Company, a second DCA case from 1998 uh, that addressed uh, this situation in the context of unemployment compensation appeals. Um, in Mace versus M&T Bank, a second DCA case from 2020, uh, it addressed the situation in the context of a foreclosure case, um, since foreclosures are obviously a pro bono, um, uh, subject of pro bono uh, representation. Um, a third example would be De Hoyos versus Bauerfiends, a first DCA case from 2019 uh, that reversed an injunction against domestic violence where the movement's sole evidence was inadmissible hearsay 
and the court concluded that the movement did not provide competent substantial evidence to support the injunction. So that's the sufficiency of the evidence um, uh, element provided in subsection E that can be raised for the first time on appeal. But what about other kinds of errors? If we did not have a bench trial in a civil action and cannot make a sufficiency of the evidence argument, do we need to move for rehearing to preserve an issue? Where an error appears for the first time on the face of a final order, a motion for rehearing may be, is, is necessary to preserve, preserve the issue for an appeal. Um, Pensacola Beach Pier versus King uh, is a very interesting case um, standing for this proposition. Uh, there, a claim, there was a claim for tortious interference with a business relationship arising from the appellant's efforts to obtain building rights on a pier. Um, they were uh, basically, and what ended up happening though, is that the trial court entered a final summary judgment rule, ruling that because there was no contract, the appellants could not prevail on their claim, evidently confusing the claim of tortious interference with a contract with the claim that the appellants actually had brought, which was a tortious interference with a business relationship. Um, this determination appeared on the for the first time on the face of the final judgment, and the appellants did not re move for rehearing. The appellate court uh, held that the trial court's error appealed, appeared for the first time on the face of the final judgment. The appellants, however, did not move for rehearing or move to vacate or move for relief for the judgment in an attempt to correct this error. Consequently, the appellants failed to preserve their otherwise meritorious argument. Um, since time is getting on, I'll just touch lightly on DT versus Florida Department of Children and Families, which had a very similar ruling in the context of a dependency case in which the appellant um, claimed that the trial court, uh, the trial court's order was deficient because it failed to uh, move through statutorily required findings. The court, the appellate court, found that there was evidence to support all the statutory elements uh, in the record and said that the the failure to lay those out in the order um, should have been raised in a motion for rehearing. There we go. Um, then uh, earlier, um, other presenters talked about motions for a new trial that are needed to preserve error. So I just want to remind you, motions for rehearing are a slightly different animal. There are plenty of situations in which a motion for a new trial is required uh, to preserve error, so like when you're dealing with the adequacy or excessiveness of damages in a jury verdict. Um, one area um, I want to uh, just touch on quickly is uh, partial final judgments, uh, since that can contain some pitfalls for uh, calendaring. Uh, if you're dealing, uh, so rule 9.110K permits an appeal of a partial final judgment immediately or at the end of an action. But if an order totally disposes of an entire case as to any party, it must be appealed within 30 days of rendition. So be careful when you are litigating multiple claims against multiple parties. You may get orders disposing of various claims and parties at different points in the case, which will trigger different timelines for rehearing an appeal. Uh, so although you may be in the thick of trial preparation as to other parties when you get an order disposing of a party, you need to be careful about making sure you're dealing with a final order and calendaring deadlines for service of a motion for rehearing accordingly so that you do not end up serving a motion for rehearing on the 16th day after the entry of a final order. That would be untimely and would not toll your appellate deadlines. So if you don't file your notice of appeal within 30 days of that order, which you might not if you're thinking you have a pending motion for rehearing, um, you could uh, fail to pursue an appeal. So rehearings in that context need to be handled very thoughtfully. All right. Um, so let's talk about appeal while motions for rehearing are pending. The filing of a notice of appeal does not abandon a pending timely authorized motion under Rule 9.020H2C. The appeal will be held in abeyance until the last authorized post-trial motion is disposed of. And I want to highlight this because it's actually a change in the rules that occurred effective January 1st, 2015. So you'll, if you're researching this issue, you're going to find a whole abundance of case law um, in, in which courts have found that post-trial motions were deemed abandoned uh, if you filed a notice of appeal. So just be aware that that case law probably predates the amendment to the rules that took place in 2015. Now the rule is it does not abandon your uh, filing a notice of appeal does not abandon your pending authorized timely motions. Um, very quickly, other areas of law such as administrative actions, um, just be aware that if you're dealing with an APA case, or a case under the APA, 
The APA does not authorize motions for rehearing in general. Uh, certain agencies may have specific rules on this, but be aware that there are circuit splits on whether such rules toll rendition. So if you're you know, if you're contemplating a motion for rehearing, you need to be very careful to review the rules and the agency rules and the case law in this area. Finally, um, professionalism. There seem to be quite a few cases in the context of rehearings that implicate professional conduct. Um, obviously, professionalism is always paramount as um, reflected in these snippets that I pulled from the preamble to the rules of professional conduct. Um, rehearings just seem to be a place in which emotions consistently run high, um, but in essentials, motions for rehearing strive to convince a judge that a judge should revisit an order, so it's very wise to be conscious of your tone in those motions. Um, obviously, as one of our appellate courts said in the Ayala decision that I quoted here, the purpose of a motion for rehearing is not to voice displeasure with the court's ruling. Um, the focus should be on the law and the facts, avoiding an overly aggressive tone and assertions that Clearly, you know, the issue should have been decided this way or that way. Um, after all, a successful motion for rehearing can change the results in a case. That is the goal. Um, an unsuccessful motion could do the double harm of not achieving that goal, plus leaving a poor impression of counsel on the trial court judge and the appellate panel that will eventually review the record. So just be mindful at all times. Um, that concludes uh, my substantive portion of the presentation. Thank you very much for your time. I hope this was helpful. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, that was great. I think we did have one question um, come in that we have a, maybe a minute for. Um, someone asked, this is always a, a tricky area with rehearings about tolling deadlines, and you addressed some of this, but um, the question was if there's a hearing that actually does get held, and you said, a lot of circumstances the judge doesn't have to hold a hearing but if a judge does hold a hearing on a motion for a rehearing is that have any impact on the tolling or um you know on the appeals in other words is there any interaction between holding a hearing and um and the tolling or is it just are they separate the hearing itself does not affect rendition it's the the what affects rendition will be the order disposing of the post-trial motion for rehearing. So, um, you know, your your motion for he rehearing transcript may be part of the record and your motion for rehearing itself may be part of the record. And as I touched on a little bit, um, for preservation purposes, that could be quite important. If the uh, flaw that you're identifying has appeared for the first time on the face of that final order that you're challenging. But um, no, for rendition purposes, for tolling purposes, uh, what you count your appellate deadline uh, where you'll start counting is from the date that the order grant or denying I guess the motion for rehearing is entered so 30 days runs from that date well thanks very much Sarah. we're right on time so that was perfect a lot of great information in there and um, we really appreciate it thank you so much mm -hmm.